Good morning, ladies, and welcome to the Hale Gaparshas Kedoshim. I hope you all had a wonderful Pesach. I missed you. And it was, of course, a meaningful Pesach. And now we're all back together again. Parshas Kedoshim. What a Hale Gaparsha. This Parsha says, Dabir el Kol Adas B'nei Yisrael. Assemble all the people, including babies in arms. They all had to be assembled. Because most of the secrets of the Torah are all in, in, invested or injected in Parsha's Kedoshim. This was the only other time that the entire Jewish people were assembled other than Korban Pesach. It shows how important, and there's also a, an allusion to 10 commandments in this week's Parsha, countless commandments, especially Bein Adam Lechavera, we find you know, between man and man, we find in this week's Parsha. Now, but we have four questions that we're going to ask on the Parsha and come up some with some amazing conclusions and um, hopefully some life-changing thoughts, especially during this period of the Omer that we're in when we are enjoined to work on ourselves and perfect our character. First question, in this week's Parsha, we are called, the Jewish people have always been referred to in many places as an Am Kadosh, as a holy people. But here there's a commandment, kedoshim to you, you should be holy. If the essence is already there, then what's the purpose of the commandment? It says, You're a holy nation to God, but yet we're commanded to be holy. Question number two. In the Mesila Sisharim, the Halig of Mesila Sisharim, for many years, you know, I, I didn't delve too far in Masil Tisharm. I thought it was far enough for me to get to Zahira since Jesus. I thought that was enough, you know, but there are a whole ladder of ascension that we're supposed to take to resemble the, the levels that Repinchas Ben Yair refers to of how to get closer to Hashem. The holiest level in the Masil Tisharm, and I, this year, Baruch Hashem, I have a lovely Chavrusa that's learning Masil Tisharm with me. I highly recommend if you'd like to really get it in a way that it speaks to you. We are doing R R Vigdor Miller on Masil Sisharim. It's called Ora Vigdor Masil Sisharim. Beautiful and very relevant to people at all times, all places. You know, in the Muslim movement, and even today, a lot of Gedolim have said women should learn Muslim for about five minutes a day minimum to be saved from all the horrible temptations that surround us. It's a beautiful thing. It gets you into the right frame of mind. But in any case, in the Masil Sisharim, the highest level under Ruach HaKodesh, under having like, um, you know, divine inspiration, which is like close to Navua, And then finally, Tchia Samesim is the highest. The Madrega under those two is called Kedusha. It's higher than Tahara, higher than uh, perfection of character. Uh, like, you know, Tahor means quite, that, that's, that would be good enough for me if I could get there. But Kedusha is like a way, and we're saying, Kedoshim to you, you have to be holy. How can you ask of the Jewish people to reach such levels? Like, what are we, and this, especially bringing babies in arms, what are they going to do, the babies, after they hear these words? Like, what's that, what does it mean? Number three, uh, we mentioned that most of the commandments in this week's parsha are between man and man like Vahaftul Recha Kamochas in this week's Parsha, and not to take a revenge, lots and lots of mitzvahs. Um, what connection does that have with holiness, with Kedushim, Kedoshim to you? And the last question, question number four, it says, Kedoshim to you, Kikadosh Ani. You should be holy because I'm holy. Now, I understand if you, you know, a person is a teacher and they have a student in their class. Now, this is not always the right um, way to approach a student. You, you know, you say, your sister, and if you do that, you crush the child to tell them your sister is so great. You could be great too. You're from the same family. You know, uh, we see in that way, it doesn't work. So, and, and we're saying, because Hashem is holy, we're holy. Like, since when have we been buddies, so to speak, with Hashem that we're on the same playing field it's just like Hashem is holy, we're holy. Since when have we become equivalents to Hashem? The Torah's Kahanim says, 
if you if you sanctify yourself, I will consider it as if as if you sanctified me. That goes even further in the Torah's Kohanim saying, if you sanctify yourself, it's as if you sanctified me. Since when does God need sanctification? And and especially when does he need it from us? Like, what does it mean? Us and Hashem, like uh, because he is, we are like, how do we understand this? So those are our four questions, ladies. Let's hopefully get some amazing answers and life-changing ideas. Okay. First thing we have to do is give a running definition of Kedusha. What does Kedusha mean? Now we're going to give some now, the, I've, these are more standard that I've heard of when I used to teach uh, Tefillah many years ago. Um, these are the three standard ones you get, but then we'll be adding on tacking onto the definition and building up on it later as we go along in the shear. But in any case, there are three main definitions. One famous definition of Kedusha means holiness in Judaism means abstinence. Now, not abstinence from everything, but that you are not needed, you're not needing this world. That you can basically overcome this world, the world doesn't overcome you separating yourself. That's what it means. Uh, second definition of, of uh, Kedusha is miuchad, unique, uniqueness. God is unique. That's why he's holy. Why? How do we, here's a running definition we have all the time of uh, Kedusha, meaning that having that second meaning of uh, uh, unique. When Hassan puts the ring on the Kala's finger, he says, Hare at mikudeshesli. Behold, you are considered holy to me? Like, what does that mean? In this case, when he says, it means you are unique to me. You can no longer play the field. You can no longer have your eyes on anyone else. We have a unique relationship. Number three, the third definition of Kedusha. So whenever we say Kedusha in Davening or in Kiddush, whatever, this is always what it means. One of these three, but we're going to see there is a common denominator. And the third definition is purpose. Purpose. It says, Before you exited the womb, I sanctified you. According to this third definition, says Rav Nevin Sal Shlita, uh, this means I set you aside. You have a specific mission, a specific purpose. You know, that's, you know, that's, that's, and that's why we say Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh three times. Because these three things are the three main definitions of Kedusha. Now, Nevinsel says that the common denominator, the thread that unites all three of these definitions, he says it in Hebrew is yiud, which means to designate, to have a designation. That is what Kedusha means. Now, what does that mean? You're, a person has to realize, especially a Jew, has to realize they are unique. They're different than the other nations. They're supposed to be above, at least in their behavior, above other nations. They're appointed for us. They have designated for a specific mission, unlike other nations. And that makes them unique, like Hashem. We find, for example, there's different levels. Levium have a certain level. They're different from the rest of the Jewish people. Kohanim, above the Levium, Kohanim Gedolim. And then we have designated times that are called Mikra E Kodesh. Like all the, all the holidays, the holiday of Pesach, for example, it says Chag HaMatzos LaHashem. Every, that holiday is designated as an special appoint, appointed time for us to get rejuvenated, to have a unique experience with Hashem. And Shabbos is considered even more than all the holidays. It's, 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 it's you know, because there's a Onik, uh, there's a Simcha of Yom Tov uh, and a Kedusha, but Shabbos is totally Kaddish because we can't cook. That, that, and, and the other various leniencies we have for Yantav, the Shabbos has a higher designation because it's more, more sanctified. So we see that people can be sanctified, times can be sanctified, and also places can be holy. We all know there's a different feeling when you stand before the Koso, or if you're in a Makam Kadosh, have a Rachel, or if you're in any place in Eretz Yisrael, it's still a different feel to it than Chutz Laaretz. 
So time, place, and people can all be infused with Kedusha, with this threefold mission of purpose, uniqueness, and separation, something that's spiritual versus relying on physicality to exist. Now, Nevinsel says something that uh, he adds on to this, and he says, when we see that something's been infused with holiness, there is really something going on here. There's a certain um, operation intact when we are dealing with holy people, holy places, and holy times. Really, we work, so to speak, in tandem with Hashem, who gave us holy opportunities. Just like Yantif is a holy opportunities, our job is twofold. Our job when we, 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 when we approach a Yantif or when we approach any holy thing, there's, we are about to be inspired. We have an opportunity to have a life-changing experience, something that will elevate us. However, our job is to make sure, number one, we don't desecrate it. Like there's certain rules, how you have to dress before the cell or how you have to conduct yourself before the cell. There's certain rules that they say people in Eretz Yisrael, you're in the palace of the king, you have to, uh, have to behave accordingly or you're not being, uh, you're not, there's, you know, you're under microscope more than you are when you're living Chutz Laaretz. At the same time, not only are you enjoying not to desecrate it, you have your second part of the mission is that you have to, you have to develop it. You have to make yourself grow from it. Like it's there waiting for you. God gave that to you. It has holiness, but you're supposed to infuse in turn. So God is giving and you're giving. It's, it, that's what working in tandem with our creator to infuse it with more holiness by being in a certain position. The Rambam says in Sefer Amidst this, now I spoke to several people about this, several Talmud Chacham so far did not get a, a total answer to this, but I'll give you the mini answer I was given. The Rambam says something very interesting. You know, we, I first have to preface it with this. We say many times, Mikadesh Yisrael v'hazmanim. It's a perfect example of how the Jews were. When the Jewish based in, two witnesses would see a new moon and the Jewish based in would get up and say, it's Rosh Chodesh. It would be because a Jewish person said those words, that would be Rosh Chodesh. And if it was the month of Tishrei, 10 days later it would be Yom Kippur because Hashem and the Jewish people were working in tandem. Him giving us the opportunity in the Kedusha but Yom Kippur is what we make of it. All these days are what we make of it. We're given great opportunities and how do we infuse them? So now the Rambam. The Rambam says in Sefer Mitzvahs and also in, where is it? It brings down in, why can't I find it? It's Kufnid Gimel, but I saw it was some, it was Parakeh of something else. I don't remember. All right, it'll hopefully pop up to me in another place. He says, you know, now what happened was since, since we're in exile, Hillel established a fixed calendar, right? According to the Rambam, not, not everyone agrees with the Rambam, but according to the Rambam, we would not be able to have holidays unless there was a population of Jewish people in Israel. I don't know how many people that I didn't get a clarity also. And I don't know exactly why I asked, I asked, why is it that we have to be there. If Hillel already was in Kaddish, the calendar, how could it be that we need Jews living in Eretz Yisrael to have holidays? Otherwise it's not. So one person told me he heard that when, you know, like Rosh Chodesh benching is like proclaiming the new moon and it only can be proclaimed in Israel. So when they proclaim that, that's like that testimony of the witnesses that we're lacking today. And that proclaims the new moon, plus we're relying on Hillel's calculations. So I just wasn't satisfied enough with that, but I, that's just the beginning. But we understand there, it has, to, and the Rambam adds, by the way, it will never happen. There will be no Jews in Israel. The Rambam adds that. So, so we don't have to worry about it. <laughs> but the point is that I'm trying to bring out here is that there has to be Jews to infuse Kedusha and there's got to be Hashem to infuse Kedusha, and they have to work in tandem. Otherwise, there won't be holiness. He says an example, another example would be a shul. 
when we walk into certain places, and I'm not even talking about the coastal or anything like this, let's say you go into an ancient shul or something like that, you can feel holiness in certain places. And the reason for this is number one, there was davening there, there was a safer Torah there, there was all, the, but it was also the people, all the prayers that have been at a certain place also are infusing it. Hashem gave us that opportunity, and we'll explain why a little later, to infuse a place with holiness, that we have that opportunity. And so that, that same thing, you know, and um, same thing, if, if a person infuses their Shabbos with Kedusha, the next Shabbos will be easier to attain higher levels because the combination of the holiness of Shabbos plus our efforts will give us that opportunity to continue growing along that path. So far, everybody with me? I hope so. Okay, if anybody isn't, you can uh, just throw a chat, but remember at the end, we will open it up to questions. Okay. Okay, so now, so we see that there's this thing is not to desecrate and also to infuse. That's our twofold mission with Kedusha. Now, when a person does an Avera, he blocks holiness. He says in Unclus, Tame means to be closed and Tohar, purity, is similar to the word Tohar, which means light. So you're unblocking when you infuse something with holiness and you are blocking when you, when you commit, God forbid, a sin. Now, previous Parshas, we were all talking about all the sins to refrain from. In Shemini, we told about all the forbidden things to eat in Achremos, last week's Parsha, we, and, oh, well, oh, sorry, then we had Tazria Mitzora, which was, uh, you know, about the Lashon Hara and, 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 and Taras and all kinds of impurities to refrain from. Achremos talks a lot about um, illicit relationships. And finally, we get to Kedoshim. And in Kedoshim, here we're told what you have to do. You have taken away the negative, you remove the blocks, the, the imp impediments. But we also have a second part of our twofold mission, and that is to inject holiness. Now, person can still be refraining from sin and yet not be a kadosh. Why? Like, for example, eating can take a person away from their mission. You know, I tried to look up the source of this last night. I was not able to because I read this within the last few months and I remembered the story. So I'm just hoping that my memory is correct. And I, I looked throughout the biography, I couldn't find it. But I do remember that Rav Shimshim Pincus, that's how he considered it such an, a job to eat that before he went home every day from yeshiva, he would spend several minutes working on himself. I think he'd go to a, sit down in shul for five minutes and learn Musser on the proper attitude to have when eating. Because he said, you can lose your whole, whole holiness in the way you're going to approach food. That a person, you know, like now we're not on that madrega, I don't think, but we have at least, you know, say bracha with kavana, to at least have in mind part of the time that, you know, we're eating to be strong to serve Hashem, that, you know, that, uh, you know, that we want to take care of our, our bodies that we're, we were entrusted with. So a person gets just eating alone, he felt you could lose your whole ruchnias just sometimes when you lose yourself with eating. I know that I heard about Rav Nissim Karelitz at Sal, that he, that his whole meals were such a thing. He didn't talk during meals because it was dangerous. And it was like, avoidus akaitis. She saw in his house, like nobody spoke. It was like, you know, that was there, that they felt it was an avoida to do it with Kedusha. There's a lot of things that get us off track, you know, late at night when people, you know, start looking at things, reading things, doing things. And then we lose ourselves and all of a sudden we notice how late it is. We ruin our whole day because of it. So there's, there's time is an opportunity for growth to infuse it with holiness. And we have to make sure that we spend the time and not get lost in the weeds and forgetting what our mission is and how to elevate ourselves above the mission and how to be unique in our mission. Like we see a Ben Sorer Moria, all he did was that he was a person that 
that was overeating and over drinking and the way he is overindulging. And then he was very, those are some of the signs that would bring him, even though we feel there maybe never was a Ben Soramora, but those are the signs Chazal tell us, the Torah tells us that we're supposed to refrain from so we don't lose ourselves and become unholy. So there are, we have to always keep in mind that threefold mission of being unique, infusing places with holiness by realizing we're, we're, we shouldn't let the, the material world dominate us. We should be above it. And thirdly, that we have to remember that we have a mission and we're unique. Okay, the Sifse Chaim brings down from the Masils to Sharm that the reason why Kedusha is the highest level in his Sefer is because a Tahor, one that's pure, is someone that had, the only way to be pure is to abstain. If you abstain from everything, you can be sure that you know, you're not letting the world get to you. Kedusha means to already incorporate the world. We're not told to be Tahorim to you. We're told Kedoshim to you because we're meant to incorporate the world and yet to not let it make us lost as to what our mission is supposed to be. It's all about your attitude. You're supposed to incorporate the world like your personal sacrifice to Hashem, a directional. That's what we're supposed to do. Now, there are different levels for this. Rav Nefetzel Shlita brings down that he heard from the Chazanish that a person is only going to be obligated at the end of days to leave, li, uh, live up to what level he could have reached. He said, for example, the laws of Kriyashma dictate um, that you have to have the proper kavanas on your level to be Yotze Kriyashma. In other words, if a person has, he's a Kabbalist and he knows all the kavanas of the Ari, he is not Yotze Shma unless he, he has those all in mind when he says Shma. But a person, if they have any knowledge of anything, they have to incorporate that to be Yotze. Now, I heard from Rabbi Kolodetsky, who's going to be speaking in Toronto tonight, actually. So anyone here tuning in from the holy city of Toronto, he's speaking tonight about, he's giving a hesped on Rav Chaim Zetzal. And then I, he's meeting privately with people afterwards somewhere else. But um, Rabbi Kolodetsky, I heard him once speak in Toronto. And he said, today, women, you know, it's not so simple. We should, if you just look in the sitter as you're davening. You know, and you try to say the words, that's already your, your yotze, the davening. But you have to try your best. That's the idea, to infuse some type of idea that this is my mission when you're saying the davening. We should feel like we are here to serve our creator, to thank our creator. We owe him so much. You know, all those ideas of things that we really should, that's infusing our davening with kedusha. And he brings that out, this whole idea of the Chazanish was from Tosfus Brachas. I have the source if anybody out there wants to know about it. Um, there's levels in everything, but there is another commandment, Uvo Sidbak. You're supposed to have Tveikas. You're supposed to have closeness to Hashem. And Kedusha is the way to get there. By realizing this world is something we have to overcome. By realizing we have a mission, we have a unique mission. This helps us get closer to Hashem. Now, we are told that um, we are told that Rav, Rav Bax Tzal tells us like this. He says that if a person was born a certain way, they can't say they're not who they are. You can't like <laughs> today. You can but that's not according to ethical considerations. Ethical considerations is God made me, gave me a mission, he gave me a path. You know, how many of these people that are changing their whole essence today, people that, 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 that what's, it's such an anti-God movement running in the world, in the liberal world, horrible, telling you, you can make up your own mission. <laughs> Forget what God wants you to do personally. He put you in this time and space and he put you in this body and he put you in this family and he put you in this situation and you're supposed to overcome it and do your mission. No, you're supposed to, you could say, I want out. I want to do a different mission. I choose, I choose otherwise. <laughs> We're supposed to choose what Hashem gave us to do. Now, our purpose is to be like Hashem but we are supposed to elevate ourselves. We find that um, 
Sips of Chaim. First off, I'm sorry, I was going to go to Rav Box, but then I realized that I forgot something from the Sips of Chaim. He brings down, he quotes from the Sforno. Sforno says, Shakavana Bachol Elaz Haros, the, the intention in all these commandments that you have to be, these, these, these um, warnings that you have to be holy. He, you're supposed to try to resemble your creator as much as possible. Kikadoshani does not mean, you know, you're going to be a God one day. No, it means you, if you really admire your creator, you want to be like him as much as possible. Just like the intention was, when God created man, when God said, let's make man in our, in our image like us. That's what the intention was, that man has that potential and man should try to live up to his potential. And that's kikadoshani Hashem Elokechem. Be'iun uvamasa, with the way you're going to be thinking. This is very Rev. Victor Miller Dick. Your thoughts are what can bring you to Hashem, the way you infuse your intentions, whatever you're doing, you can make yourself more godlike. And in your actions, um, that will make you, that will also um, bring you to be more godlike. Kalalu Shadavri brings, the Ramchal brings down, this is again from the Sifse Chaim. I'm not sure I had everything that I'm not missing. Yeah. He brings up from Ramchal, beautiful thought. Inyan HaKadusha Hishe Adam Dave Kol Kach Belokav, a person should be so close to God. He will never separate his mind from him. Um, that everything he does that's physical will be uplifted because he wants so badly to use this world as means by which to get closer to his creator and resemble his creator. So that's our purpose, to be similar to Hashem. We're given that potential and, and, this, and, and, you know, and to be and refrain more from physicality, which makes us closer to Hashem. Now, Rabak says the following, the holiness of B'nai Israel cannot, is inherent and can't be erased. When we were made in God's image, he said, for example, Rabak Zatzal knew of a Kohen in Shanghai who re resigned his position. He wrote a letter of resignation to the rabbis of his city. And he said, I am from now on resigning my position as Kohen because he wanted to marry a divorced woman. The resignation is not valid. You can't, it can't erase who you are. You're a Kohen. You created a Kohen. That's who you are. <laughs> the same thing too. Jewish people are, you have inherent Kedusha. I'm Kadosh Lashem Alekechem. You are, an, you are a holy nation. You can't just say, I'm not a Jew. I'm not holy. You are too bad. That's what you're, you're, you're meant to be able to achieve. And there are many mitzvahs and there are many um, elements of, 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 of a person's advantages. The Jewish advantage of being, having a Jewish neshama, you can't give back. You can't get up, give up on. That's who you are, you know? And today we have to realize that we have something extra that we have, you know, the reason why most Jewish people are into dressing formally, that's considered a form of sinus as well, is because that whole speech they always give you about being royalty. But if you don't remind yourself that you have this potential, you will, you will lose those, those opportunities. You will abandon it. Brings down, I've mentioned this before in other shirim, but it's, we need it in our generation. It says, as a chazal, um, ha'ochel b'shuk pasal le'edus. A person that eats while walking is not kosher to be a witness and based in. He can't be a witness under the chuppah. He can't be a witness. But he always said you could drink outside today. He said, because everybody does that, but eating outside, like eating while you're walking, you know, people licking their ice cream cones, whether walking around, like, you know, like everybody else in the world does. You're, you're, it, it says Rashi, Ho'il ve'en makpid al kavodo, since he doesn't care about his own honor, e'no bosh lazalzo ba'atzmo v'lihi pasel me'edus. Because of this, 
He, he, he's not embarrassed to put himself down, make himself into a nothing. He can't testify in a basin because if you're not, if you don't think you're great, you're not going to be careful with every word you say. If you don't think your words matter, if you don't think you matter, you're not going to achieve this high level that you're, you're supposed to reach. We see the generation we live in when people walk around with torn jeans as their, as their thing because they have no regard for themselves. We are supposed to, we're enjoying to have tremendous regard for ourselves. That way we'll keep our, the element we have within us that makes us above other, others. We can't give up something you're born with and we as Jews have a higher calling. Now, we find, you know, you have to uphold and develop what you are. There's a directional, go above the world and we have these God-like choices to make. So we are supposed to think that we have this advantage. We can't give in on that advantage. He gives, it gives an example. When Ravox first moved to America, he went into a shul in New York and people told him here, we don't have a Mizrachvant. Now the Mizrachvant, the Eastern wall is the wall where you usually put the rabbi sits at the Eastern wall. And then you put the, the, any uh, great Torah scholars, perhaps some philanthropists are sitting up more close and they have that system. They said, now you're in America, everybody's equal. If everybody's going to be equal, then, then there's nothing. There's nothing to live up to to, 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 to uphold. If we don't give respect, for example, to Torah scholars, everybody's equal to us. The bus driver and the Torah scholar are equal. Then where are our standards? If every, if that, that's, the, the, that's the sum total of democracy sometimes. The, the negative side of it, the spin of it, could be that if you're going to start giving the same regard to people, let's say, that don't have a degree just because of, uh, you know, whatever, I, they don't have to have the same qualifications in something, then you're not, you're not respecting qualifications. You're trying so hard to be democratic that you don't have any aspirations. You have nothing to look up to, nothing, no inspirations. There's nothing that may, means anything to you. So we have to realize that everything has to be great to us. We have to look up to something Otherwise, we have there's, there's, there'll be no standards. You know, this it, it can't just be everybody's equal and everybody can do what the heck they want. We have to have somebody we look up to, whether they deserve it or not, is in a Shem's hands. But if somebody's a rabbi, we have to give them respect. If someone's a Talmud Chacham, even more, and we have to you know find the, the the respect that we have to give them. The the Talmudim of Rabbi Akiva says Ravaxed. The problem was when they said they didn't give each other respect, that's not really, he says it was much more refined level, of course. These were holy men. All of them, I'm sure, have gone Aiden. They just didn't deserve to pass the Masora on to next generations. Perhaps as Rabax, because they considered themselves equal to each other. They were Democrats, okay? They felt, it, it, it says it says in Pirkeavis, something very unusual, Yehi kavod. Your friend should be to you as a teacher. And it says, your, 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 your student should be like your friend. Your friend in Perkeva said should be like your teacher and your teacher should be like Hashem. Why are we putting them up a notch when they're really not there? Let's say teacher's not Hashem. There's no way a teacher is Hashem. I don't care who they are. Even the Heiliger of Chaim Kanievsky with all of the, he was a Malach, but he wasn't Hashem. Right? He was a Malach, but he wasn't a chef. <laughs> you know, and we find your friend should be like your teacher. They're just your friend. They're your, they're your equal. So I heard an interpretation. Well, he gives the same interpretation. If you don't put people up a notch by nature, we tend to look down on them. We tend to minimize everything in life. The, the way to be Kadoshim to you is to max. Everyone is great. Things are great. And therefore, my mission is great. I'm great. I have a great responsibility. Every, every, every word we utter is great. Therefore, it, it could be Lashon Hara or it could be make somebody's day. Every, every, everything we wear is great. We have to treat our, our bodies as great, as, as, as gifts we were given by the creator. Everything we have is an opportunity and we can't minimize God's work in this world. And what Tamidi Rabbi Akiva did was they merely put each other on equal footing when they didn't see the Mila's enough of their friend. They didn't look at them as, oh, my friend, my teacher.
So if we don't, if, if, and that's why during this period of time when we're, when we're supposed to work on ourselves to deserve the giving of the Torah, we have this Parsha. And we also, if we, we, can't be, we can't have the Torah if we can't see how great a person can become, if we don't see the real goodness. Brings down from Rav Ruchim Blavavitz, and he said, if a person felt he's very tired and he can't afford his rent, he decided, you know what? I'll, uh, I'll put myself into, I'll check into the local zoo. I'll put myself in a cage and uh, rent's cheaper there, the free meals and all that. Everybody thinks that's funny because come on, you're a human being, you're not an animal. Nobody would do this because you're not a behemoth. But at the same time, people, whenever we, whenever we dress undignified or whenever we speak in an undignified manner, we're saying, I'm not so great. I heard something on the Bitochan hotline amazing idea they gave there. They said, you know what it means today, what the Navarticers say today, it means to be a humble person. You know what it means? Humility today. Humility means to see the greatness in others. Usually people view humility, meaning, you know, I'm supposed to view myself as less than others, but today to, we, we don't think we're great enough. We don't see that we're, we're up for the job, we're up for the mission, up for the calling. So instead, our mission instead is to put everybody else up. That in turn will make us put ourselves in the proper place. But that makes us see, boy, according to what I'm supposed to be, am I really reaching it? But really, we're afraid we may get down too often. So in order not to get down, be look, looking for, look for the milas, look for the advantages, the greatness in others. See the greatness in other people, you know, and not, not try to put other people down. You know, even in our mind, um, once somebody asked the Chavetz Chaim, can you think Lashon Hara? And the Chavetz Chaim said, and then you'd be a fool. Because thinking Lashon Hara means putting somebody else down. Like, do we realize how everybody's in the image of God and their greatness? Do we know the milas of every single person? Are we able to, to, to discern that that's what we should be doing? At the same time, a Jew should not wear should not wear Vuchuko Samlo Selechu. It was in last week's Parsha. You're not supposed to go like the nations of the world. A, a wild example would be like a lot of Rabbanim would say that we are not supposed to dress. We are not supposed to dress like the rest of the populace, like let's say to wear uniforms for basketball. It's not a Jewish thing. You know, we're, we're not just like everybody else with a kippah on top. We're not supposed to follow in the styles. We're not supposed to have the same type of ideas. Here's an interesting idea that Rav Box brings down. He says that the Noda Yehuda was a very famous posek in the 1700s. It was once asked a question from a person who owned um, land. And this person asked him if they're allowed to go hunting as a sport. You know, it was very popular in those days, you know, the whole hunt thing. And um, he answered him, you know, because the person asked is a question of like destroy, you know, of, of like, is it, it causing an animal distress or is it a question of a, um, a, you know, like destroying something and, you know, like you're not about you're not allowed to destroy something because it's not a person. So are we allowed to do that? So the Nodi Buddha answered him, a Jew should not go hunting. And he said, first of all, there is a problem with, but he said, in general, it's not a, what is a Jew doing? Why is he hunting? So a box adds on. He said, if we'd go to a non-Jew and we would tell them, you're not allowed to waste your time. That's what hunting is. It's a waste of time. Would they understand that concept? That time is every minute is sacred and we have so much to do. You know, we just lost our Halega of Chaim Kanyevsky. I just saw an unbelievable thing about him that um, it mentions, it says it's, a, it's a, a phrase used in Shir Hashirim. He said he lived by this, these three words. It says, Shemen Turak Shmecha. Your name should be like oil. What does that mean? So if Chaim explains oil is the one liquid when you add anything to it, it gets displaced, right? Um, you know, you add water and oil, the oil will rise to the top. So he says Torah is represented by oil. 
and and Tori is represented by oil and um, the um, we are supposed to. It, it, he said he this is how he how he thought it's unbelievable. He said your brain is like a cup of oil because you're a Jew and your brain is Torah, right? Pure, you have a pure slate when you're born. He said, if you put in your brain any secular type of thoughts, now I have to qualify. First of all, he's talking about a man who is obligated to learn Torah every spare moment he has, unless he has to relax. Now he's on a very high level to begin with, so we're not talking about the rest of us. But he meant to say, Anytime I get too involved with this world to the point where it disturbed, he said, you're displacing some of your Torah. So he made it his personal mission to never focus too much on anything physical. He didn't want to. He felt like it's displacing his Torah. And in fact, he said like this, the more every time, oh, and, and every by the bit of opposite, any bit of Torah you learn displaces the, the, the negatives. That's why people are saying today to learn Musa every day, you can learn Masilis to Sharm or Shari Tshuva or Chovas Malavavos, five minutes a day at least, you have that opportunity to displace some of these other thoughts we may have, which are not, um, that are not refined enough to allow us to get close to our creator. The other things distract us. They make us think that life is forever. They make us think that we have other things to do with our life. Like we're supposed to just, you know, the main focus, if we'd be on a holy level is that Avodah Hashem is our main purpose and everything else is a sideshow and we should not get distracted. You know, it's almost like going to an arcade, like they used to have them in the exhibition in Toronto, where, you know, you had to shoot down camels. And meanwhile, there's all these bunnies jumping across the screen and you have to not pay attention to the bunnies and just focus on the camels in order that you win the prize at the end. You know, but this is what life is. We are, we are, have a mission. We're really supposed to get higher levels of clinging to our creator, appreciating our creator, um, serving him and, and appreciating everything he's giving us and giving us an opportunity for the world to come. And instead we have all these distractions on the line. So every time we learn any kind of Torah or go to a shear or daven with Kavana, we are adding oil and we're displacing some of the water that, uh, you know, this way there's, there's more oil to deal with. And um, the oil, you know, gets displaced by the water. So if Chaim Kanievsky, for example, he used to have to ask his family what after blessing you make on food because he didn't remember what he ate right before because that was his prayer to just be focused. On, and he used to, he used to um, when it came to, uh, he didn't know where the light switch was in his house. They once found him learning in the dark. And he said, I, I don't know where the light switch is in the room. And yet... He knew the entire Torah by heart. You'd ask, he was the man. If you needed, people would come to him besides for blessings and everything else, any source, anywhere. You'd quote him something. He could tell you where it was in the entire Talmud, Babli, Rishami. One time somebody asked him a question on something in Maral, and he's thinking for a moment and he said, not in the Babli. Then he says, not in the Rishami. Oh, oh, it's in the Zohar. And he said exactly where. That means he entire, he had it all at his fingertips. And everything, people, like he knew everything there was to know in Torah till, till his last day on earth. And that was his whole mission on earth. And he didn't, didn't leave his mission. I, he definitely was Kadoshim to you. And he definitely kept all those mitzvahs there as well. Now we have to, it's a slow process. We can't do it all at once. We have to keep all the Torah at once, but we have to try to keep our minds as pure as we can and not let ourselves get distracted. Technology today is such a distraction. And we have to, you know, really be strict with it. And if we have to entertain ourselves, it should be as minimal as possible and as closer as possible. And we should not try to get in the weeds with it because even if a person is not able, if they're not so physically fit that they go running around helping the world, there's so much else we can do with our life. Why squander these precious moments? That's, the, that's what we're enjoined with, with Kadoshim to you. You are designated for a purpose. You have a mission, you're unique. You're holy and you have to do it while incorporating this world. Find in this week's Parsha, I'm almost done. So don't fear not. Um, uh, now, uh, holiness applies to Ben Adam Lechavero as well. Why? Because holiness, like for example, there's a big one in this week's Parsha, not to take revenge. 
Masil Sharma himself says that this is only easy for angels. You know, this, this is something you have to be holy to be, have good relationships with people. You know, by nature, there's people we just click with. There's people we just by nature don't click with. And we have to work on ourselves to be able to see the good in others and get along with others and sometimes um, ask forgiveness, even if we're not wrong, you know, just to keep the peace. We have to do a lot of things to keep the peace. And all of that, the people we're surrounded with, is, our, our, the people we've been surrounded with are purposely given to us as a laboratory for us to develop our mitos. And that's how Bain Adam Chaveiro does definitely apply to Kedoshim to you. You know, we've, they're half of the Ten Commandments were Bain Adam Chaveiro. Rav Scheinberg Zatzal tells us that a Baal Midos, a person who's called, a Baal Midos is a person that has good Midos. Mida means measurement and Baal means master. He mastered his, his, his character. Master your character means that you're in control of your character and your character does not control you. And everything has a measure and every time they're not, but like for example, it's times to be stingy. If you see somebody that you're about to give something to is going to use it for illicit purposes or something like that, just give an example. There's times to be stingy. There's times to say my family comes first. There's times to be everything, times to be jealous, to be jealous of, of somebody that you can learn from. Every single media has its place and it's with our application of it and putting it in its proper place. We're supposed to hate physicality for ourselves, but for other people's yenner's gashmias is minor ruchnias, says Rav Yisrael Salanter. Another person's, we should make sure the person, like Avram Avinu, each person got his own tongue with mustard. You think Avram Avinu ate a whole tongue with mustard every night? I doubt it. You know, he, he just, for his guests, the world was uh, the limit. You know, somebody told me once they're in a certain Yerushalmi house where the people slept, they basically had nothing but the bedroom for the guests. The guest room was you'd, like a hotel, you know, like this, we, we have to have different standards for other people than we have for ourselves. We have to have that measurement in place to be a kadosh. Now we find that there's, just as an aside, I saw in the Yadayim Mochichos, he mentions that um, there are three of the Ten Commandments mentioned in a different form in this week's Parsha. Instead of saying, Lo Sirtzach, you can't commit murder, we're told, Lo Samod al Dam Riecha, you should not witness your fellow man's blood being spilled. So it's more refined state, it's more of a Kadoshim to you level of not, it's the same idea. Because why don't we kill? Because we are supposed to have tremendous respect for our fellow. And you know, this, not lo samod al damriach is a big principle in Lashon Hara, for example, that one of the leniencies of Lashon Hara is you're allowed to speak, you're allowed to gossip when it comes to saying, um, uh, saying something that could hurt, that if you don't say it, somebody could lose their livelihood or lose a shidduch or lose something. Then you are supposed to, or lose out in life, they marry the wrong person because they're gonna be told, oh, he's not, he's, he's mentally fit when he's not. You know, you're supposed to tell the truth in certain situations. And even though um, it's Lush and Hara, but it's you have to worry about this other commandment, you're not supposed to watch your fellow's, fellow's blood being spilled and remain silent. You're not supposed to see something happen and do nothing. You know, there's a story about Rebetzin Kanievsky, Sekhrana Lavracha, that, um, I, I, I'll never forget this story. I just think it was so special. It's in her biography. Um, one time she was walking along uh, after shul, she was walking back to her house with a woman who was not so modestly dressed. And she, you know, she came for a blessing. She came for advice. And a man in B'nai Brak stood up and he said, this is how you dress in B'nai Brak? He said, go back to Tel Aviv. That's what he told this woman. Rebetzin Kanievsky was absolutely horrified absolutely horrified and she, she she afterwards she was so shaken up she had to take a pill and she said she told her husband i just witnessed a murder somebody she told the man you you're, you're worried about sinus you're not worried about embarrassing your fellow man in public spilling his blood in public how can i, I i'm you're not invited to my house and everyone else in b'nai brock is and she told her husband i just witnessed a murder what did i do wrong i i, wa I watched somebody's blood being spilled 
You know, we have to think about something like that. When, uh, when it says, don't stand on your, don't let your uh, friend, you know, suffer because of you. There's another one, tell children, don't look at people being brought into an ambulance. It says that in Perkyov, person, a person is in a horrible state. They don't want to be looked at at this point. Everyone's so curious. They have to run up to the ambulance to see, oh, who is it this time? You know, it's not our business if, unless they need help. If they need help, yes, you be there. But to go tell people, what are we supposed to, you know, we're not supposed to see a person in their embarrassment. Uh, okay, instead of saying to bear false witness, in this week's parsha, it says, lo selech rachel, shouldn't gossip. And that's teaching us a lesson. Gossiping is like bearing false witness. We don't know all the sides of the story. We don't understand the depths of our friend's soul. We can't bear, we can't talk against somebody because really we may be speaking falsehood. And a third thing, it says, um, lo sachmod, you're not allowed to covet. In this week's parsha, it says, behafta l'recha kamocha, instead. Like, because coveting is, why don't you want your friend to have what you have? I mean, why is it that you want everything he has? Why be, well, not be happy for what he has? Be happy for he has if he is different than you. That's what we're supposed to rejoice in our other, in our friends and what they have. Um, okay, now the, um, let's see if I have anything else I wanted to say. I believe I almost finished. I think I, I summed up everything I was trying to say. So in short, <laughs> to re review what we said this week's Parsha, the three aspects, the three definition of uniqueness, of being having a mission and having being above this world. Don't let this world control you from your mission. Don't let it distract you or detract you from your mission. That's holiness. And we're all, we have that potential within us. We're an Am Kadosh and we're supposed to act that way. We're not supposed to resemble the other nations. We're supposed to dress differently feel differently, act differently, and we, we're supposed to be a notch up on them. The Talmidi Rabbi Akiva, they, they could consider themselves equals, and that's why they didn't meet their mission. We can't be like the Caliph that's eating in the, in the marketplace because we're, we're not kosher Jews unless we try to say, I'm a great person, I'm going to dress dignified, I'm going to feel dignified, I'm going to act dignified, our inherent Kedusha, we're not all equal. We're supposed to look up to some people and we're supposed to look up to ourselves. I'll just end off with a story I just heard recently from every Yisrael Brock in Cleveland saying a story about um, Rav Chaim Kanievsky's greatness. And because of the fact that this man dispelled any outside influences in his life because he wouldn't even, he didn't want to get too involved with this world. You know, people made fun, by the way, of, of, of Rav Chaim that a lot of boys, when they would go into him, they would take off their watch because Rav Chaim used to tell people to, take off, to not wear a watch. I asked my Rav Rav Lowy, Shlita, and I asked him, you know, and some people listened and some people were told by Rabban not to listen. And I said, Rav Lowy, how could it be? Rav Chaim says something. Why is it some people don't listen? He says, Rav Chaim remembers when he was young, men only used pocket watches and during watch on your, on your arm was a woman's garment. He thought it was a woman's garment. Now, Postkin don't agree with that, but that was Rav Chaim's understanding of this world, you know? I think someone once asked him a Shiloh about cashers of a blender. And then he said, first, tell me what's a blender. Anyway, so, that, you know, like, um, so, you know, the, the, it, it, so that's why not everyone listened to that, that sock. I mean, they'd have to talk to Rav and make sure that they have a hetzer for that. But that's why he was, he was so removed from it. You know, like he, he did, but look, he, look what he ended up to be. Everything, pure soul that he returned to his maker. So Yisrael Brog tells a story that, that happened um, concerning Rav Chaim. Somebody from Eretz Yisrael was, was really, was doing well, lost all of his money somehow, was really in a terrible situation. It was the beginning of Corona. And the person wanted to go collecting, wanted to go to America like everybody else did to, to make some money. But all the other Mishulachim told him, you can't go to America. Come on. They're going to close their doors to you. They're going to tell you, you can't even go to shul. It's Corona. It's the very beginning. And, and people were terrified in many minyanim, uh, many, many shuls. I know a few in Toronto, they would have a sign up sheet. You had to sign up to be able to get 10 million on Shabbos because they only a certain amount of people and the same people. And there was a whole thing going on very, very specific to Corona. So um, they told him not to go. So he says, well, how am I going to get this money that I need? He goes to Reb Chaim for a bracha. And he said, what? and he said, also, please tell me, what should I do? 
and on this is Rav Chaim that you know people say was so removed from this world. He said, "Look, make a bissela hishtablus. Do a little bit of effort. A little bit of efforts. That's all you have to do. Make a little effort, and Hashem will help you." And you know, he says, "You go there. You do what you can. Do as much as you can. A little bit, and then Hashem is going to help you. You'll see." So he went to America. I don't know how he got to America. That's another question. But besides that point. Um, okay, definitely could have, couldn't have come to Canada, I'll tell you that much, unless you were from China in the beginning. I, everything was close to, America, to, to, China, uh, to Canada. Anyway, so, um, but that's beside the point. So uh, anyway, so he, uh, he got to America. Sure enough, he got the shuls. He wasn't allowed in a lot of shuls to daven. He knocked on doors. The lights were out. There was nobody opening doors. They were terrified to open their doors to anybody, especially another country, Israel especially, who wanted anyone from Eretz Yisrael. He didn't know what to do. He's walking along the streets. His family is calling him and, and asking, how is it coming? And he said, nothing, absolutely nothing. But Rav Chaim told me to make a bissel of shabbos. So I did the normal, whatever it is that they stay a week, two weeks, uh, uh, Michelle stays. And he said, I hopefully will get what I want. He hears, he, he walks by one night. He sees the lights on in a certain large home with mezuzah, of course. And he, he hears music playing. He says, what, during Corona, like what's, what's happening here? So he knocks on the door. He decides I'm gonna try this house. Knocks on the door. The music's so loud, they don't hear him. He knocks really loud, really hard on the door. And all of a sudden for a minute, they turned off the music and then he knocked again and they opened the door. And uh, the Balabaya says, come in, we've been waiting for you. And he said, what? And I said, what? What are you waiting for me? I think maybe he means somebody else. Anyways, they're playing music and everything. And um, so the Balabai says, I have something for you. So he takes out his checkbook. He tears off a check that was already written. And he hands it to this person. He looks at the check and his jaws drop. It's a check for $50,000. And he did not understand where is this coming from? Like what? Me? Like, so he decided this is an Ehrlich guy, an honest man. So he says, listen, are, are you sure I'm the right person? You know, I, I, I don't think this is mine. I don't think that, I, I, you know, most people don't get that kind of donation, especially I've been waiting for you. He thought maybe there's some other Russian Shiva he's waiting for or something like that. It's not me. He says, I don't think you meant me. He says, if you're saying that, then for sure it's for you. And in fact, he said, I'm going to give you an additional check. And he gave him another check for $50,000. What, what happened? So the, so the Balabayas, the, the owner of the house tells him, I'll tell you what happened. He said, recently, I underwent some difficulties in my business. He said, um, my, uh, my partner was audited by the government. They didn't trust. All of a sudden, we had a lot of money coming into the bank. We made a huge business deal and we made a lot of money and a lot of money came in the bank and they audited him and the IRS was on his tail and they were driving him crazy. And, and he said, like, mom, that they, they, they were you know, threatening him and he was, uh, it, he was getting the threats daily. And his friend was almost put in jail. But at the end, thank God, they let him off. They, they, they saw he didn't do anything wrong. And he said, and recently they started with me. They had my partner in the beginning, but now they're, where's this money coming from? And he had proofs for everything. His, his you know, uh, he, 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 he gave, he said the, the truth about the whole business deal and he had paid all the taxes and he had done everything. But for some reason, they made it very complicated and it was months that he was entangled with this whole deal. So finally, he said, yesterday, they finally told me the case was dismissed. And he said, I was so relieved. I decided to make a Sudas Hoda, decided to make a, a, a celebration to thank Hashem for sparing me from all this distress. It was tremendous. Like he was threatened with jail time and the whole thing. It was, it was horrible. And he said, and I said, the first Meshulach that's going to come through my door, I'm going to give a check of $50,000 to. He said, at first, I was going to minimize it. I was thinking 10, 20. He said, no, Hashem, I, 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 I he promised this to himself during the darkest moments that he was going to give a huge check to the first Meshulach if Hashem gets him off the hook with this. So he did. And this man came home with $100,000 because Rav Chaim said, you have to do a little bit of Ishtablis. So that's what I'm going to leave you with for this week, ladies. I, a week, I wish us a week that we really have the yuds, that we really realize what we're designated for in this world 
We need a yearly reminder, kadoshim to you. I thank you all for listening. I thank Elisheva Shields for her magnificent efforts towards this class and all of you, and for Sarah Rachel Fabian for sponsoring the class. I wish all of you a wonderful week. And um, now we can unmute ourselves.